really took us into a new place. So I want to welcome you this morning to the Scribal Conservatory Arts and Worship Center. We're going to go ahead and really jump right on in. We're going to be talking about um, exploring the life of God. We're going to just look at some things that we don't often think about every single day. I mean, not that we don't think about them at all, but they're not things that we meditate on often. And I believe looking at the Lord this way from this particular perspective will keep us encouraged because things are getting harder for a lot of us. Um, things are um, changing so rapidly that people are having to live life on their feet. And we need to always be in a position of exploration. Exploration is a term we use a lot inside the scribe school, but not so much inside the conservatory. But I want you to become comfortable with that term. I want you to love that term. Um, I was talking to someone recently and they were telling me about their conversion story, how they came to the Lord. And I, I said to them, I said, it's a wonderful story. I enjoy hearing stories like that. And, and it was just beautiful talking to them because 30 years later, they're still in a good place of recognizing who is at the center and they're not religious with it. You know, they were raised in the church, but God kept them in such a way that the church system, the machine, it didn't hit them. It didn't um, consume their lives to the point where they couldn't see God. And I love that because sometimes our spiritual things, it's not just church that makes us religious, but it's sometimes the weird spooky things that Christians do that are really over the top and unnecessary that can also make life seem so religious. But the thing about God is, is that God is not a religion. And I hope that we're able to see that he himself is just God. And when we look at his life and when we explore how he responds to things, we see him differently. One of the things that I really want us to understand is that God really is a spirit. So when we understand or see him from a spiritual perspective, I don't want us so much to start seeing him like um, some supernatural ghost on a television show that we watch, but just the presence of goodness, the presence of um, strength and power, the presence of a force in our lives that, work through, that works through love. I want us to see him as an extension of ourselves, but to begin to see him far beyond our own humanity. And it's hard because we're in human form right now. But if God is a spirit, we are spirit too. The soul of ours is not tangible in the sense of um, we can go and I can pull your soul out and say, hey, this is the soul of so-and-so and so. So we're, we're all spirit. And it's just a beautiful place of seeing God meet us from his spirit to our spirit, to what he has created. So this is going to be fun. I'm not real sure about where we're going to go. I have an outline. This has been on my heart for a while. It's really born partly from the dream course that I've been doing in the Dream Writers Academy, but it is extending into something that I am really enjoying right now. And the more turmoil I find that life brings us into, the more this teaching just begins to jump out at me. And I hope that you're going to be blessed by it this morning as well, as well. So this is just part one and hopefully we'll be continuing at least for a couple of more weeks on exploring the life of God. So I, I wanna just throw this out there and this is a question and you can respond in the chat, but have you wondered who God is beyond what we want from him? beyond what he has done, beyond the various covenants we've studied about, beyond the people he called, beyond what he has done for you, what he has given you, and all, and all the other things we have that concerns us 
with about how God serves us. Now, I want to just say, I want to point out real, real quickly that God wants us to need him. He wants us to depend on him. He wants us to, um, to, to turn to him at every single turn. But listen, I just got to say this. Have you ever thought of him just as God, what you doing? You know, God, what's going on? Why'd you do that? Why you show up like that, God? What does your life look like? You know, when people ask me about my life and they ask me, what is it, you know, that, that drives you? Over the years, I've trained myself not to answer that question with what I do. Um, it's an assignment that we've been given out in the Certificate to Teach the Scribal Anointing Program since 2010. The first question that I deal with, with everyone who enters that school is this, who are you? You cannot tell me about your degrees. You cannot tell me um, what somebody else has said about you. You cannot tell me what you do. You, you have to lay all of those things out because I need to know who you are, not all the stuff around you that clouds your day and that makes you feel as if you are something. Who are you without any of those things that give you definition? So we want to begin to look at life like this. We want to begin to look at God like this. And we're talking God. We're talking the God who wants to reveal himself to us. Who is he outside of all these things that we beg him for? He loves us asking him for things. He loves our dependency on him. But have we taken the time day by day, moment by moment to do that? I have not. It's only been the recent months, um, the few months that I've really been looking at this that I have. And especially these last couple of weeks, I've been like, Lord, I'm just going to lay down what I want today and just think about who you are. How can you show me who you are that is different? And I want to tell you that I believe children do this all the time in their own way. Our children don't have to have a formulated question in advance. They are just children and they are just simply exploring everything around them. And I'm not telling us to revert to that process and go kicking rocks through the woods and what kind of, I'm not saying that. I'm just asking you to let's consider what it is to be God and how he might perceive, perceive his life. We follow the life of the Kardashians where we used to, you know, I don't, I never have. We follow the lives of all these other celebrities and celebrity types. We follow all of these people, but are we following the life of God? Are we looking at his reality show? Really? It's a fascinating reality show. If we take the time to step into it. And so I like this picture in the background because it's like, this is, this is who God is. He did this. What in the world caused him to be this creative? Look at all the different kinds of trees and the landscape and how everything is positioned. Ooh, look at the sky. Who did this? Oh my goodness. How are you living, God? How are you living? And so I want us to come into this place because I think it'll help us. I think it'll settle us. I think it'll give us hope. I think that it will give us peace. I think that it will cause us to see that even on the very worst day of our lives, it is okay. It is okay. It's okay. Even if it doesn't work out in my favor, it's okay. Even if it's my last breath, it is okay. How can we get there? Oh my goodness, how? And we're going to talk about people who got there in, a, in future sessions of this. We're going to talk about that, that because I noticed some things about a few people in scripture that caused me to understand that they knew the life of God. I want you to know that God's life is eternal. That's one thing that we're going to look at as well. The life of God is eternal. Oh, 
I'm very grateful. And I want you to be grateful too. Have we considered his life, not simply in light of our own existence, but within his own merit, within the, within the merit of the life that God has lived and is living? Mm. I want to just share these four points. God is omnibenevolent. It means that he is all giving and all good. I'm not sometimes so convinced that we understand that. I know that for years in my life, I was always waiting for God to punish me for something that I'd done. I was always looking for um, some type of violent rebuke, a snatch, a pullback. It was just the way that I was raised in the gospel. And some of you probably were raised that way too. And as a result, there was this fear and it made it impossible for us to see God as omnibenevolent. But the scripture tells us God is love. It tells us taste and see that God is good. It tells us that, that God will never leave us or forsake us. It tells us that God is comprised of all of these fruit of the spirit. It tells us all of these things about God, but for some reason, we still perform. We still perform as if we have to prove to ourselves that he is capable of loving us, of being with us, but he is omnibenevolent, all giving and all good. Oh, wow. Just the Lord's word love is, um, you know, we use that word in an American context and a hum humanistic context, which it, it, which really is, that is not fair to the gospel message because that's not how God loves us. He loves us in um, Ahava, in a covenant of marriage. He loves us in a place of sacrifice where he gives and he gives and he gives and he gives and he keeps giving even though nobody believed that it was going to rain. Even though women and men were mixing with angels and he had to come and, and destroy the world. He was crying out, look, come to me. I'm building an ark. I got to start over. This thing is going haywire. It's not how I planned. And you hear him say, I regret it making man. How do we consider God, his testimony of his suffering, his testimony of how he has overcome? We don't think of God that way because we think that he doesn't feel. And we did a whole teaching on emotions and how emotions are from God and and how the Lord never told us not to have emotions. He just said, don't live out of them. Don't make decisions out of them. Don't plant tents around them. Don't dwell on them. Don't let them overcome you. And it's not just the emotions that are negative. There are some good emotions that can hurt us, like excitement. You can be so excited about something that it blinds you to the truth of what it is. If you can be so excited that you throw out all the warning signs that you just can't see them because you're blinded by your own joy. So God is omnibenevolent. We are familiar with him being omniscient, all-knowing. This is very important in the life of God because sometimes we don't think he, he knows everything especially when disaster out of disaster, trial after trial is happening around us. We're wondering, and I've said this, where are you, God? Where are you? But in the life of God, he's omniscient. There is nothing he does not know. There is nothing he is not aware of. There is nothing that is a surprise or a shock to him. Nothing. He's omniscient. He's also omnipotent, all powerful. Oh, all powerful. Some of us believe he's all powerful. And because again of how we were raised and different things like that in the gospel, we think that power is for punishment. 
We think that power is for judgment only. We forget the power of forgiveness. We forget the power of grace. We forget the power of mercy and we turn all of our attention to God's going to get you. Oh my goodness. In God's life, he is all giving and all good. He is all knowing. He is all powerful in every sense of that word. My goodness, he created a world out of complete chaos. He created a world out of chaos. See, if we really believe him, then we believe all these things are true. We believe all these things are true. If we're really honest with ourselves, we believe some and parts of this is true because it's hard for the heart in human form to understand the magnificence of God. Yes, that's a good one. Someone said God is like the boogeyman. <laughs> yes, for some people, for some of us, you know, he is but he's all powerful, all knowing, all giving and all good, even when all hell is breaking loose in your own life. All of those things are still true. He's omnificient, all creative. We love that word when it comes to songs, when it comes to dancing, when it comes to admiring nature, those beautiful pictures I shared with you just a second ago. When it comes to our own creativity, we get that. We get that, but he's also strategically creative. He can take a cricket line from the last 30 years and he can make that line so straight that you wonder if it ever had a crook in it. He is all creative. All creative. All creative. Everything that is creative is creative because God is creative. He's omnipresent. And it's not just God is here. It means God is everywhere all the time. Even in horror, God is present all the time. He can't be all knowing and not all present. It's just, it doesn't work like that. And not all present. Omnipresent means he's everywhere. I just, you know, one thing that I do personally, but well, that's a whole nother teaching, but I'm going to share this. Every time I take a breath, something, well, not every time, but sometimes when I take a breath, I think about how we don't know where the wind is coming from or where it's going. But I do know if somebody sucked out the air out of the room, I would drop dead. I believe that, you know, we would all drop, we couldn't survive. And I see the wind as the breath of God around us. I see it as such. Without the air that we breathe, there's no oxygen in our blood. It's just, you know, everything, God is everywhere. So I see the wind in many ways like the presence of God, just in the natural realm. It's kind of a good way, at least for me, to think about it. Think about him as the wind. There is, we share wind with everyone around the world. There is no animal, there is no plant, there is no person that we are not sharing the wind with, the air with at this very moment. Think about that. Absolutely, we're connected through breath. We're connected through breath. What is this life of God like that he has put all kinds of things together like this? I think it would help us sometimes to just stand outside and look up to the sky and just be, my God, thank you. This is all you. This is all you. This is all emanating from your spirit. This is all emanating from your will. This is all emanating from your hope for us. You have all of these things working for us in our humanity right now. Spirit, spiritual man doesn't need that kind of breath. 
We have a different kind of breath in our eternal place and that eternal presence that we have with him. God's life presents these truths in every expression. Omnibevolent, omniscient, omnipotent, omnificent, and omnipresent. I just, I just love this. I want to go real quick to Job 38. And I just want you to um, walk with me. We're going to get to our main scripture later. But I want to share this with you now. Um, let's see, where is it? Give me one second. I'm going to pull that up. Find out where it is and we'll go there. It's so important for us to be able to tap into the presence of God, to know what he wants for us, to be able to see through fresh eyes, because sometimes the cares of life clouds us so much that we can get lost in, um, here it is, here we are, here we are. I hope you can see it. Can you all see the passage of scripture? I had to go and change my my pages. If not, I'll flip to it. Let me see if I can get there. Hold on. Just make sure. Okay. Yeah, that's it. Just want to make sure you can see Job 38. Here we are. So nope, that here it is. Job 38 is right here. I just want to read this. I'm going to, I'm going to read it from the Amplified Bible this time, because I think there's more meaning there. And I just want to say this about the Bible and reading. Sometimes I go through multiple, multiple translations that helps. Um, I think we need to see it in different ways, but when I'm studying, hardcore studying, I go back to the New King James and the King James for word studies and things like that, because though there are more references, more opportunities for clarity, we can get um, the Greek, the Hebrew, the Aramaic, whatever you need, you can get with those. Amplified is good, but sometimes the wording is different. I just like what the Amplified has to say. Now, why is this important? Because sometimes this is one of the best examples in the scripture of the Lord revealing who he is, of the Lord saying, this is how I live my life, of the Lord saying, we focus on this passage so much about Job's situation, but when you really begin to say, God, I want to know what you're experiencing, I want to know how you feel about things, I want to know, Lord, what you're expecting. Job is also that book because you get to see how outraged God was about Job's doubt for him. And Job was going through what we would call through today an enormous trial, an enormous tribulation. I mean, all his children was dead. He lost his job, so to speak. Everything he owned was in ruins. His body was infected with with all kinds of disease. And I know that in, in theology, there's debate over whether this is an actual story or whether it's just um, a wonderful story that proves things of God. So I want you to know that that conversation is out there. I like to look at this as a situation that really happened you know, and that's what I'm standing on as far as this, because I think, and when I say what really happened, I'm not saying everything that Joe went through may have been the way it's written in this particular book, but you do need to know that there's a lot of debate in the theological realm, evangelical and charismatic. It doesn't matter. Lots of debate over whether this story was um, a parable or whether this story was actually something that took place but we're going to treat this as a true story. And we're gonna put ourselves and our lives in this story right now. And we're going to also see God from the perspective that we need to see God because I hear a lot of people claiming they're Job where you can't be Job. Job is Job and Job was Job. We can only be who we are going through our circumstances and situations where we are. And we need to own that particular part of it. We're not like him in that way. But suffering is suffering regardless of how you're suffering and who is suffering. Grief is grief. No matter how much grief you have, it's still the same emotion. What you're going through in your grief 
is the same emotion someone else is going through in their grief. The only thing that's different is the circumstances. So we should be able to empathize with one another just based on what those things are. Sorrow is sorrow. You know, um, joy is joy. It is what it is. You know, so we are in this place when listening to this story about Job. So we know everything that happened to him. If you don't, I want to encourage you to go back and read the story for yourself. But by the time you get to Job 38, the Lord is responding to Job's complaining. And we all have complaints. When there's pain in my body, I'm crying out to the Lord. When there's sorrow in my heart, I'm crying out to the Lord. We're supposed to do that. You know, Job had a relationship with the Lord that he felt comfortable enough to begin to question the Lord. There is no reason why you can't question the Lord. There is no um, death lightning strike that is going to come to you for questioning the Lord. For Job, that was part of his process. And without all of the complaining, without all of the trouble, without all of the real raw emotion, would he have ever gotten a response like this from God? Oh my goodness. Would he have ever gotten such an amazing response? Because look, this is what God said. Now, everybody sees this as a rebuke. I don't necessarily see, I see it as loving guidance and correction with firmness. That's how I see it. But I see God as taking this opportunity to share his heart. Remember, we're talking, I'm talking about Job, but we're really looking at the life of God. So this is what God says to Job. Job 38, he said, then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind. Oh my goodness, I'm gonna stop right there real quick. So this is the Lord, this is God, this is his life. And so he presents himself because remember God is a spirit. So how would a spirit, a pure Holy Spirit present itself to his people? Because he could have taken on a human form. He could have sent an angel, but he decided to appeal to Job in this time in a whirlwind. Why in the world would God want to show up as a whirlwind in this man's life? If you don't know what a whirlwind is, if you go back and you look through the scriptures, you're gonna and scriptures and through um, some historical texts, you're going to learn that a whirlwind is like a tropical storm, more akin to a hurricane. So I want you to think about that. So, and I also want you to know this before I go any further because we don't want to mix things up. God revealed Himself to people in the old covenant because he was kind of a micromanager back then. He was on the scene managing the lives of his people. There was no mediator. There were not a thousand gazillion trillion prophets on every corner that you could call to and get an answer from the Lord. There was no um, published Bible that you can go buy at Barnes and Nobles. So we have this whole thing going on here where God is micromanaging the kingdom in the old covenant. And I'm using that and a flattering, not a negative way, but that is what was happening in the old covenant. In the new covenant, and I'm talking Bible books right now, not the um, agreement, but when we go into, we look at the New Testament and we're looking at that, we don't see this kind of micromanagement. We don't see God sending whirlwinds. We don't see people waiting for storms. We don't see them following clouds around why? Because the cloud is in us now. You know, we have the guidance of the spirit. We're no longer dependent on priests and prophets. The, the presence of God is shared to everyone equally at a certain point. There's an outpouring that takes place that gives us a newness and it frees God up of all of the micromanaging he had to do. So the covenants are really new. You have the Old, Coven Old Testament scriptures, and then you have the New Testament scriptures and the life of God in the old covenant is his past. I'm gonna say that again. This is very important. We're looking at God's past. When we look at Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, we're looking at God's 
past. When we move and we look to Christ, we're looking at the Lord's new day. We're looking at his new life. We're looking at his new move. We're looking at his new management. We're looking at his new strategy. The life of God is not so different from our lives. We have a past and we have a present. Oh my goodness. I hope that um, you all are following me. If I'm moving too fast, tell me to slow down. I promise you there's a point to this. There's a point to this because we need to explore the life of God. And why? Because so often we're still bringing God's past into our present. I'm going to say that again. We're bringing God's past into his present and our present. We're bringing God's past into his present and our present. Do you want people constantly bringing up your past to you? Well, 10 years ago, you were teaching this. 10 years ago, you believed that. 10 years, well, people grow because God grows. Mm, God changes patterns and methods. He doesn't change who he is, but he does change how he does things. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Yes, he is in his life and who he is, but how he walks out and carry things through, he does differently with every generation. Oh my goodness. So who is the God that's speaking to Job right now? Oh, Job 38. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind. How did Job know it was a whirlwind? How did he know it was a storm, a hurricane storm? God came into Job's chaos. Oh my goodness, and he brought calm. But this is what the Lord says. He, this is what the Lord said. And we're going to look at this. He said, who is this that darkens counsel, questioning my authority and wisdom by words without knowledge? In other words, Job, you know me, but you don't. You think you know me, but you don't. All of this you're going through and you're questioning me now? I thought you knew me. This is God. I, I want you to hear this from God's perspective. Not just thinking about poor, miserable Job. And why is this important? Because all of us have trials that we go through. All of us have tribulations that we are facing now and things that we will face. Some of us will have or have had some of the most horrific things anyone could imagine in life. And God is meeting Job in this place. But instead of coming with poor baby, I hope you feel better. Maybe you need to take three days out from work. Maybe there's something here about God's life that we need to capture. Why didn't God immediately enter in by patting him on the back saying it's gonna be okay. What is it that God wanted to reveal in this? Job has 10 children that have died. His wife is turning on him. His body has pus and sores. His friends are starting to question his authority. Why you, you know, are you sure you with God, Joe? Because man, you looking bad right now. I mean, that's where they're at. But here you have God not addressing any of it. Not one word about his suffering in this passage. Oh, God, how are you living, God? Lord, how are you living? To people today, oh, you cold, you too hard. You... How are you living, God? This is what God is saying. Who is it that darkens counsel, questioning my authority and wisdom 
by words without knowledge. Do you really know me? That's what he's saying. Now gird up your loins like a man and I will ask you, and I will ask you and you instruct me. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you know and have understanding. Who determined the measurements of the earth if you know? Or who stretched the measuring line on it? Omnibenevolent, omniscient, omnipotent. I want you to see what he's telling Job. Who determined the measurements of the earth, if you know, or who stretched the measuring line on it? On what were its foundations fastened? <laughs> or who laid its cornerstone? That right there is a whole message by itself. Oh my God, when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God, angels in this particular passage shouted for joy, where were you? You don't know me, Job, not really. I'm trying to take you into a place of peace and shalom. I'm trying to reveal a bigger story of my life to you, Job. I'm trying to show you, Job, how to live for me, how to prove me, but you've taken your focus off of me, Job. You're not asking the right questions. You're asking me why you're suffering. You're not asking me who are you, God, and how can I be demonstrated in your life right now through what I am suffering? God, right now, how can you demonstrate to me who you are? How can I tell your story through what I am suffering right now? That's the question Job should have been asking. Job, who enclosed the seas with doors and burst it forth and went out of the womb? Who did that, Job? When I made the clouds its garments and thick darkness its swaddling band, who? Oh, I did that, Job. I know everything. I know everything. I know everything under the sea. I know everything deep, deep within the core of the earth. I know everything, Job. I know everything about you. I even numbered the hairs on your head, though they shed and grow back. I've numbered every one of them from the time you were formed in your mother's womb. And even when you're drawing your last breath, Job, I, I know about that. Oh my God. When I made the clouds his garment and thick darkness his swaddling band and marked for it my appointed boundary and set bars and doors defining the shorelines. And I said, this far you shall come, but no farther and where is your and where and here your proud waves shall stop since your days began again have you ever commanded the morning joe since your days began do you have the power to command the morning and cause the dawn to know its place so that the light may take hold of the corners of the earth and shake the wickedness out of it oh my god the sunrise shakes out wickedness. The earth is changed like clay into which a seal is pressed and the things of the earth stand out like a multicolored garment. The light is withheld from the wicked and the uplifted arm is broken. Have you entered Job and explored the springs of the sea? Or have you walked in the recesses of the deep? Have the gates of death been revealed to you, Job? Or have you seen the gates of deep darkness? Have you understood the expanse of the earth? Tell me if you know all of this. Where is the way where light dwells and 
As for the darkness, where is the place for the darkness? Job, where is it? That you may take it as territory, take it to its territory, and that you may know the paths to its houses. You must know since you were born then, and because you are so extremely old, Job, I guess you know everything. This is what God is saying to him. Oh, you know everything, huh? You, you think you know everything. What about me, Job? I know everything. This is what God is saying. This is the life that I live, Job. I'm going to read it to you some passages different in a minute. I want to show you something. He says, have you entered the storehouses of the snow? You mean there's a treasure house and a snowflake? And we know that's true because people have microscopes now, many microscopes, and they can zoom them in on a snowflake and they see immaculate design. Snowflakes are not just chunks of ice falling from the earth. Every snowflake has a different pattern. It's amazing. Or have you seen the storehouses of the hail? God is sharing this for a reason, which I have reserved for the time of trouble, for the day of battle and war. Oh my God, a snowflake, hail, battle, war. Oh my goodness. Where is the way that the light is distributed or the east wind scattered over the earth? Who has prepared a channel for the torments of rain and for the flood or the path of the thunderbolt? I have, Job, to bring the rain on the uninhabited land and on the desert where no man lives, to satisfy the barren and desolate ground and to make seeds of grass sprout. Has the rain a father, Job? Or who has begotten the drops of dew? Out of whose womb has come ice, Job, and the frost of heaven? Who has given it birth? Water becomes like stone and hides itself, and the surface of the deep is frozen and imprisoned. Can you do that, Job? Can you bind the chains of the cluster of stars, Pleiades, or loose the cords of the constellation Orion? Can you lead forth a constellation in its season and guide the stars of the bear with her sons? For those of you who wonder where all the things about the galaxy, the Milky Way, <laughs> listen. Do you know the ordinances of the heavens or can you establish the rule over the earth? Can you lift up the voice to the clouds so that the, an abundance of water will cover you? Can you send forth lightning that they may go and say to you, here we are? Who has put wisdom in the innermost being of man or in the layers of clouds or given understanding to the mind of man or to the heavenly display? Who can count the clouds by earthly wisdom or pour out the water jars of the heavens? when the dust hardens into a mass and the clods stick together because of the heat. Can you do that? Can you, Job, hunt prey for a lion or satisfy the appetite of a young lion when they crouch in their dens and they lie and wait in their lair? Who provides prey for the raven when his young cry to God and wander about without food? Oh my God. This is profound, but what's even more profound is that in the life of God, he's thinking of how to do all of these things. In God's life, he's figuring out how to lay the foundation. He's figuring out how to determine the measurements of this and that. He worked all of this out in his life. He's the ultimate mathematician, the ultimate scientist, the ultimate medicine man and healer. The, uh, everything here. He, the life of God. The life of God is so creative. All omnificent 
that here he is telling Joe that you have the mind that I'm giving you, Joe, but you never even considered how I came up with all that I have, all that I've already done. And here you are worrying about this one thing. You don't understand that I am eternal, Job, and so are you. Oh my goodness. God's life. He's trying to cause us to see that our life is his life. Oh my goodness. He's trying to get us to see that our life is his life in the measure that we've been given it. And he said, look at me. People have betrayed me, turned their backs on me. They've cussed me. I made all of these people and they left me with eight on a boat and only one was mine. Oh my God. All the people in the earth and he called one Noah. And Noah brought up seven of the people with him by default. And here we are complaining because only two people came to our meeting. And God is trying to introduce us to his life and bring us into his life. But we're not getting it. Oh my God. It's just amazing when we look at God and his effort and the things that he is setting before us. When we look at how he lives and how he has endured being rejected for eternity, really, in the lifespan of humanity. But there he is. Look at this. All giving and good in spite of. All knowing and all he wants is for people who will be all giving and all good through Jesus. All knowing through the measure that they have been given. All powerful in their area of release and their area of positioning in the earth. Omnificent in the areas that they are called. Omnipresent everywhere that they can be in the measure of their humanity right now because our human form limits us from being one with God in its totality. God's life presents these truths in every express expression. Oh my God, image and likeness, likeness and image. You know, I, I often tell people, you know, I, I have no problem with, with teachings on self-care and wellness, but at what cost? Don't be angry with me. It's a problem when we can't advance into God's likeness. That's why I don't teach those things because right now, they have become a crutch and a problem to the body. And people spend three and four years trying to get together something that they are supposed to overcome. We have to put our past behind us in order to move forward. Everything can't be made sense out of. Father, I pray right now for those who have a problem with what I have said. Father, I pray that you give them revelation. I pray that you give them revelation knowledge. I pray that you give them understanding. If we are in trials and tribulation, our number one priority is to move forward as fast as we can. Because if we linger in the situation, it will beset us. It will take a foothold. It will grab hold of the soul and cause us to forget God. It doesn't mean we don't acknowledge what is happening. It doesn't mean we don't take time to take a breath. 
and run around naked somewhere for an hour until the crazy leaves. It doesn't mean that we don't do those things, but it does mean that we have to move in the grief. We have to move in the pain. We have to move in the suffering if it is possible. We have to learn the real lesson of God's life, not just Job's suffering. It's easy to identify with, with Job, but it's not easy to identify with what God wants from us. Very difficult, very difficult. At some point in time, I had to lay down the fact that I would never have a mother or a father. I mean, how long can I hold on to that, Teresa? Nothing you pray or say is going to change that. And no one who comes into your life ever will be able to replace what you never had. You have to learn how to become to others what you did not have. You have to learn how to get what you need from Jesus and not people. Oh my goodness, I thank God for those in my life, but they will never replace God in my life. That's the place we're trying to get through with this journey. Every place of hardship needs to be filled with the very life of God that he gave us. Oh man, I just hope that this is helping. I want to read you um, uh, uh, one, one or two scriptures. It says this, Psalm 77 and 18. It says, um, the sound of your thunder was in the whirlwind. The lightning lit up the world. The earth trembled and shook. When you're going through your trial and your tribulation, your earth is being shaken. You have to find the voice of thunder in the whirlwind. We have to enter into the life of God that says, Job, you can't do any of this, but I can. Because it's my life. My life in you, Job, is to find and show you the path that needs to be taken. Oh my goodness. I'm showing you the path, Joe. Enter it. Oh my goodness. Moving on. Second Kings. As they were going along and talking, this is Elijah and Elisha. As they were going along and talking, behold, there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire, which separated the two of them. And Elijah went up into a whirlwind in heaven. This is for those who thinks the whirlwind and the old covenant always had to be bad. God is able to take us up in his whirlwind. But listen, this is the importance today because remember the whirlwind was God's past. The whirlwind was God's, the spirit of God in the earth manifesting as God micromanaged things. In this day and time, the whirlwind is in us. We have access to the Holy Spirit at all times. At all times. You do right now. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. You have access to Holy Spirit right now. That whirlwind is, is in us. When chaos comes, that whirlwind, when we are rooted and grounded and being strengthened, that whirlwind should be blowing like it has never blown before because the very life source of God, the life that God lives is within us. I hope that you all are hearing and understanding this part because we're still going to be building. What can we learn about God, hold on to and commit to remembrance through these truths? Why do we need to rethink 
embrace anew the life of God. Because if we can understand the life of God and his capability, we can better understand what we have on the inside of us. Because the life of God is not just his breath. It's who he is in us. Who are you, God, in me? A whirlwind is a controlled type of hurricane. In God's life, this was one of the ways he chose to manifest his presence. God is the spirit. Oh my God. And he's trying to constantly bring us in a new place. Yesterday was hard, God. If that's what you're saying, today is a new day. Today is a new day. Holy Spirit. The spirit of God within me. Today is new. Renew your spirit within me. Pray prayers that will be effectual. Pray prayers that will release what is already in you. Get with people that can help you release your own inner whirlwind. Because if you're waiting to be caught up in a whirlwind, you're waiting on what you already have. Oh my goodness. God's testimony is the intentional and specific revelation of himself to humanity. God's testimony is the intentional and specific revelation of himself to humanity. But most people are waiting for the revealing of God through a prophetic word from someone else. Or they're waiting for the revealing of God through a prophetic word. They just waiting to hear God. Let me hear God. Let, let, let. Oh my God. Make use of what you have. The life of God is in you. We don't just need a word. We need to trust what he said. He had to remind Job that he already knows everything, that he's everywhere. That if we could be convinced of those four things, if we could really, God, be convinced it would change our life. Spiritual maturity is bringing us daily into this understanding of the life that God lives. It is God bearing witness. I used to ask God, God, I've never written my testimony. I've never written a book of my life. I understand why now. Because it can't be my story. It has to be a testimony to the life of God because if all I am doing is recounting my past, how is that revealing Christ today? Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. God has a past and a present. I want to go to our last passage, 1 John 5, if you have your Bibles. I'm still a big supporter of um, a big supporter of you all using your printed Bibles. I do. I study with my printed Bible. I don't just say, I read stuff online. If you see a lot of highlights and stuff, it's because I'm thinking on my feet. I'm sitting in the waiting room, reading passages of scriptures if I'm at an appointment. Um, if I'm sitting upstairs or laying and I get a thought in the night, I'll wake up and highlight a passage if I'm reading something. But mostly I try to use my physical Bible. I'm less distracted. I'm more at peace. Here we are. First John 5. I'm going with the Amplified again. Just bear with me. Everyone who believes, adheres to, trusts, and relies on the fact that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, 
is a born again child of God. And everyone who loves the father also loves the one born of him, his offspring. So that's just another way of, of the greatest commandments being stated. Because if you love God, then the other one, you know, the other thing is loving God and it all points back to loving one another. And we love Jesus. And you can't really say you love Jesus if you don't love and point to that commandment. People hate the love scripture. There's a whole, there are denominations that cannot phantom God's present. They always want to relate to God's past and it's killing the body of Christ. God's past is all they care about. They cannot reconcile the two. So that's okay as long as you can reconcile it because this is, we're talking conservatory and we're speaking conserving what is important to God, right? So we know better. We don't have to enter into living in God's past because he doesn't want that part of his past recounted into the present because it messes things up. We can talk about it. We can love the whole word, but we have to recognize what, what Jesus has done. So verse two, it says this, by this, we come to know, recognize and understand that we love the children of God. When we love God and obey his commandments, orders, charges, when we keep his ordinances and are mindful of his precepts and his teachings, for the true love of God is this, that we do his commands, keep his ordinances and are mindful of his precepts and teaching. We have to remember. And these orders of his are not irksome. They, in other words, they shouldn't be grievous to you. They shouldn't be burdensome to you. They shouldn't be oppressive because the new agreement that Christ made, that God made with Jesus demands that the law, the yokes and the bondage be stripped away. And so now we have the law of love, the law of mercy, the law of grace moving in us. So there is no condemnation. It says, well, whatever is born of God is victorious over the world. And this is the victory that conquers the world, even our faith. Listen, your victory, whatever happened yesterday, listen, I, I just hear this. Whatever happened yesterday, yesterday being the last years of your life before this moment, today is the testimony that you made it. Today is your presence. The testimony of Jesus Christ is that you are here now in this moment, having overcome every single thing that happened all the days of your life up until this moment. Just think about that for a minute. Don't worry about what you're going through in this present time. Consider for a moment that from the conception until the moment you are in right now, God has been faithful to you. Mm. Think about that. Hold on to that. If you wake up in the morning, Say it again. All the years of my life up until this moment, you have been faithful to me. You have proven Job 38 in my life. Now your victory becomes a part of God's life story. Oh, man. For the true love of God is this, that we do his commands, keep his ordinance, and are mindful of his precepts and teachings. And these orders of his are not irksome. For whatever is born of God is victorious over the world. And this is the victory that conquers the world, even our faith. Who is it that is victorious over the world, but he who believes that Jesus is the son of God, who adheres to, trusts in, and relies on that fact. This is he who became, 
who came by water and blood, his baptism and his death, Jesus Christ, the Messiah, not by the water only, but by the water and the blood. And it is the Holy Spirit who bears witness because Holy Spirit is the truth. So there are three witnesses in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. And these three are one and different. And I want you to hear this. These three are one. These three are one, not three different things. From conception until now, your life is a testimony of the witness of the Father, the witness of the Word, and the witness of Holy Spirit. It's not just that you overcame that bad such and such or whatever. It's not just that you overcame that sickness. That's part of your testimony, but the real testimony is that you're here now. You're here now in the Lord, pursuing him, walking out what he's given you. You're, you're entering the life of God. There's a point, I promise. And there are three witnesses on earth. Oh my good. So you have the three witnesses in heaven and you have the same three witnesses in the earth. The spirit, the water, and the blood. And these three agree and are in unison. Their testimony coincides. If we accept as we do the testimony of men, if we are willing to take human authority on what they say God has done, the testimony of God is greater than this, of stronger authority, of greater power, of more truth for the testimony of God, even the witness which he has borne regard regarding his son. He who believes is the son of God, who adheres to, trusts in, and relies on him has the testimony possesses the divine, divine witness or attestation within himself. He who does not believe God in this way has made him out to be and represented him as a liar because he has not believed, put his faith in, adhered to, and relied on the evidence that God has borne regarding his son. Now, God was expecting this from Job before Jesus was ever a witness in the physical earth because he expected Job to know this. This is very important. Job did not have the spirit of the living God. We do. To whom much is given, much is required. God was like, listen, I've planned this all out. I've worked all of this out, Job. I've met you face to face. I've come to you. I've guided you. Oh my goodness. And he says in verse 11, and this is the testimony, the proof that God gave us eternal life and this life is in his son. Listen, you are living proof. Whatever you may be going through now, the very fact that you are here and you are faithful to God by your presence in life, not on necessarily this Zoom, but your presence in life, you are the witness here. I'm trying to ask God to give me the best way to describe this. The life of God is proven by your victory. The life of God is proven by your victory. Everything he has declared would take place. I will never leave you or forsake you. I am your God. You will be my people. Everything I'm writing on the hearts of men. I've saved you by the spirit, the water, and the blood. Everything that constitutes the creativity, the being everywhere, every, every, the foundations, every, your ability to eat and breathe, grow up, your ability to learn, to think, everything that we see him proclaim, in Job 38, that he did, you are the evidence of his testimony being true. 
And God is saying to us, if we can look at the whole story, if we can look at the whole picture, we won't get lost in the one drowning moment that we are facing right now in this life. Because we will look at the sum of all the years and we will see the hand of God. We will see it. Not out in the sky somewhere. But in our lives, I look at my grandbaby who they didn't expect to live. Every day, they don't know how that child is living. But there she is. Some of you have been through things that can make movies. But this moment right here, the sum of your years, you're the victory in the Lord's testimony. You're the witness. You're the witness to the life of God, not just running your mouth and telling folks how he blessed you last night. That's good. But the testimony of Jesus Christ is the spirit of prophecy. Is what God prophesied from the beginning coming to pass in your life. It's not the car. It's not the new house. It's not the keys to this and that. It's not the job. It's not the famous person you bragging about that you got to talk to on the phone. It's none of those things. It is him. God is trying to get us to a place where we can withstand what is to come because this life is under the hands of the evil one. Satan has rule over this world right now, but he doesn't have rule over you. Everybody here needs to say, I'm a witness to the life of God. Oh man. Let's go back to Job 38 and we're done. When you read this again, I want you to hear this in a different way. Verse four, I laid the foundation of the earth for you. Don't you understand that? I determined the measurements of the earth so that it would sustain itself. I stretched it out to make room, make sure that was room for you, Teresa. I used gravity to hold the foundations of the earth in order. I even laid the cornerstone that causes the earth to pivot on a trajectory that it can't fall out into nothingness. When the morning stars that I created sang together, I saw Teresa in my holy imagination, the angels. I saw them in the natural. I shouted for joy because they went into worship because they understood what was happening. I closed the sea with doors so that you wouldn't drown. And I made sure that I put stuff in the sea that you could eat. And when it burst forth and went out the womb, where were you when I caused the sea to do what it did in the earth? And I did it all for you, Teresa. When I made the clouds its garment and the thick darkness its swaddling band. Oh my goodness, I did that. Because I was thinking my whole life, my life has been about you. I marked everything for its appointed time. I set the bars and the doors and I defined the shorelines. I told the storm that it could only come this far and go no further. And I even watched the waves rise up before me. I saw them proud and stern and they raised up. But I told them they had to stop. Since your days began, Teresa, have you ever commanded the morning and caused the dawn to know its place? No, but I did that for you, Teresa. I told the sun to rise so you could see it and behold its beauty. I told the sun to rise so you could correlate that to my sun. 
and that his light might take hold of the corners of the earth and raise it up and shake the wickedness out of it. Look at the sunrise to in the morning, Teresa. Let me remind you of the light of the world. The earth is changed into clay into which a seal is pressed in it. I put that seal there, Teresa, and I can break it anytime I want to. And the things of the earth stand out like a multicolored garment. Look, there you are taking a picture of my rainbow. There you are standing before the ocean, admiring it. There you are telling people how beautiful the sky is. Oh my God, Teresa, I love that because I created that for you. Oh my goodness, their light is withheld from wickedness and the uplifted arm is broken. Don't worry what happens, Teresa. The trees might burn, but they're my trees. I commanded them to grow and I can blow on them and breathe life again. I'm asking you, Teresa, have you entered and explored the springs of the sea? Have you walked in the recesses of the deep? Have you been able to do any of those things? No, I haven't, God. Have the gates of death been revealed to you, Teresa, or have you seen the gates of deep darkness as I have? I created the earth out of chaos. Have you understood the expanse of the earth? Have you? Tell me if you know all of this. Where is the way where light dwells? And as for darkness, where is its place? that you may take it to its territory. Oh my God, the Lord takes darkness to its territory. Where are you that you may know the path to its house? Do you know where darkness lives, Teresa? Only I know that. You must know since you were born then and because you think you know everything, but you don't, Teresa. Have you entered the storehouses of the snow? Have you seen the storehouses of the hail? I took the time, intricate detail, Teresa, to build the storehouse for a flake of snow. And you want me to believe that I can't take care of your problems right now. If you can believe I did this, Believe that I can take care of you. The life of God is centered exclusively on him revealing himself to us. Not so he can show off, but so that we can really be one with him and know the power that is within us. Father, I just thank you for the life of God and the exploration and the journey that you have us on today. I pray, Father, that you will touch our hearts and cause us, Lord, to move out of our selfish places. And I know when we're going through, it doesn't seem like we're selfish. It doesn't seem like we are, are battling against you and your presence is so strong and you want us to be in the midst of that. But Father, I pray that we will take a minute and remember that you are God. That we will take a minute and realize as bad as this is, God is a spirit, I am a spirit. I am a spirit and I believe that one day I'm going to eternally be with him without this flesh suit. But while I'm in this flesh right now, God, I need you to teach me how to be with you in every moment was there is crisis in my life and I don't think I can escape it. And I feel as if I'm going to die. I need a moment to remember and to grow in my remembrance in that moment, God. That is why you're within me. So that I can live your victory. The testimony of Jesus Christ in me is the spirit of prophecy. The testimony of Jesus Christ within me is the spirit of prophecy. The testimony of Jesus Christ within me is the spirit of prophecy. That is the prayer that I will pray today, God, because you have prophesied 
everything that was, is, and is to come concerning me. And I choose to live in your present, God, and stop bringing up your past. Because the present Jesus, the present Christ, is the only thing that is bears witness to me right now and to you. We came by way of water, the spirit, and the blood. He came that I might have life and have it more abundantly in Jesus' name. Hallelujah, God. Glory to your name, Father.